Cool, so please welcome Larissa. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, thanks so much uh, for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited uh, to be a small part of this. Uh, I was at another event the past couple of days, so I couldn't come before, but I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, my work, a lot of my work uh, is about um, the way communities use technology, uh, and it comes out of a, an interest in, uh, or, or kind of an allergy to the concept of outreach, because I've been a part of a lot of activist organizations over time where people develop things or have ideas and then they try to find a community to use the idea. And often what that means is they have no idea what communities want or need because they've come up with the thing first. Uh, and so a lot of what I do is look at how communities are already doing things and try to uh, pick out the, the things that seem to matter and connect those with technologies or principles that are already happening or show how those are not reflected in uh, some activist and technological uh, priorities. So um, it was really great to see this talk uh, before that is about um, a, a, a long-running free radio community, a long-running uh, technical uh, sort of set of projects that's also connected to a, you know a living community of people in this in central Berlin who are actually using it because I think uh, again that's where a lot of this falls apart. So for me, um, I'm come from the academic side and I also do music, which is part of the importance of uh, technology for me is in relation to how communities. Uh, center their own culture and their own identity. Uh, um, people need to have cultural spaces in order to then have the support emotionally and psychologically to go out and fight against all the things that we're all fighting against. Uh, and so I'm interested in that uh, as well. So my interest in pirate radio came out especially of pirate radio in relation to music, in, uh, especially in Europe and in especially in England where it's very powerful. And one of the things there um, that is interesting is how important uh, pirate radio became, I think, because it was in spaces that were controlled by the communities uh, that uh, that used it. So uh, in England, uh, poor people historically have lived in towers and nobody else because middle class and upper class English people aspired to have gardens. And so you couldn't build housing for people that who wanted to be upwardly mobile or live according to their class uh, that were towers. But that meant that towers are really good for radio. So pirate radio in England became very powerful within the communities who lived in the physical space that allowed them to sort of dominate that uh, that technology and it continues to be powerful even today in the web radio era and I think part of it has to do with the, the sort of physical and historical connection to the to the technologies of radio the, li the little bit that I understand of them so anyway I got interested in this question of what kinds of conditions help people decolonize their relationships to each other build different economies, different identities, different ways of interacting, and the role of technology in that. And so I'm going to do two, I'm going to say two kind of theoretical things, uh, just ideas to have in your head. Again, I come from academia, so I do uh, occasionally want to articulate these things, but I, they come from engaging with communities and I think are useful there. So the first is a concept called exilic spaces. And this basically is like a little bit like what I was describing with pirate radio in London. It comes also from work that I have done in uh, Jamaica, uh, looking at things like uh, illegal street parties, uh, where people make culture that would not be welcome in elite spaces. Uh, and that culture becomes very powerful uh, and globally influential. And so an exilic space is a space that where what happens within it is people are uh, making relationships to each other and to a kind of culture that is not uh, defined or controlled by dominant society, by colonizers, by uh, uh, capitalists, uh, not wholly defined by that. Uh, but what they need often in order to be exilic is they need to be a little bit unregulated. They need to be outside of society and outside of the view of the state. And so uh, people need to be able to defend 
the border of the exilic space, or there needs to be something that limits the ability of powerful people to come into that space. And it might be a cultural thing, or a social thing, or a technological thing, but there has to be something that says, when you come here, you come in on our terms uh, to, to this space. Uh, and so that's what gives communities kinds of control over their, uh, um, over what happens in that space. And so this is one of the things that led me to many arguments when I was in the Bay Area, because a lot of people on principle were arguing for openness and transparency and connectedness as a sort of undifferentiated good thing that automatically brought goodness. And uh, for communities that are uh, facing all kinds of oppression, it's not necessarily liberating to be open to everyone because powerful people can come in and f fuck your shit up, if you'll pardon the expression. So that was something I was really interested in. I think I don't need to define pirate radio for this audience, uh, but it is broadcasting without a license uh, in most uh, countries. Uh, the spectrum is owned uh, and you have to get a license to use it. Uh, int I'm interested and I don't know much about what's happening in places where radio is moving to the digital um, realm. Uh, I think in Norway now, there is, it's all digital and I'm wondering what's happening to the old spectrum. Um, if folks wanna talk about that, I'd love to hear it. And I'm gonna talk about what in the US is called ethnic radio. Uh, and the term ethnic is very problematic, uh, obviously, because everybody has an ethnicity. Uh, and usually in the US, it's code for people who aren't white. But what I mean here is uh, radio that is in content oriented around self-identified ethnic communities. Because what is interesting in uh, New York, and this is a little bit different than in London, is that radio, uh, pirate radio is heavily dominated by ethnic communities who are broadcasting in their own languages uh, uh, and uh, they don't connect very much with the mainstream radio world or with other media platforms and they're often not online or not very much online. Uh, and so I say the two overlap because reasons and I'm going to talk about those reasons. So just a hint, it flourishes in New York. Um, there's a really great guy who's a sort of self-taught expert on New York Pirate Radio named David Gorin. He has a website called the uh, Brooklyn Pirate Radio Sound Map. I encourage people to check it out. And there's also people everywhere who love to just scan and count. Uh, you know, this is Pirate Radio is one of those sort of old, like, obsessive uh, sort of um, sub-communities. There's people who just sit around all day and say, this person who runs this website this Facebook page actually just goes through and says every few days, these are the stations that I find. Uh, David Gorin uh, for Brooklyn Pirate Radio Sound Map did this one, uh, did this hourly. So this is throughout one day the number of stations that he found in New York alone. So what's interesting is that the New York radio spectrum is entirely full before you get to pirate radio. Like there's no open, there's no space. You can't get a license, even low power FM, because there's just no room. It's a very densely populated place, and many media networks are heavily invested in reaching at least the moneyed side of those audiences. But there are lots of other people who clearly want to use radio, uh, and so broadcast pirate radio persists. And there's a continual small flurry of articles about how quaint this is, or how cute this is, or how whatever this is. Um, uh, but it is interesting because especially this is true now, 2018, uh, in the era of web radio. And so for me, this is the kind of thing that I love to look at, which is why, why are people not taking advantage of something which is argued to be new and liberating and uh, better and faster and wider and more and all that kind of thing. Uh, if you look, uh, this is a map from a few years back of um, enforcement actions by the FCC in shutting down pirate radio. They released this themselves, so I don't know, I mean, I don't know what they put on here versus what they don't, and obviously I don't actually trust them to tell the truth, but, but it is interesting to note the places where pirate radio enforcement actions happen, which obviously is not the same as the number of stations, because you have to call in an enforcement action. So it doesn't, it does, it's not just like automatically happening. So this is where people are complaining to the FCC. So there's more, it's a, it's a map of conflict, not of presence, if that makes sense. But still, it suggests that there's probably more pirate radios where the big red dots are, and those are uh, especially, but not entirely, in places where you're going to find a lot of immigrants, right? So Miami, New York, uh, Southern California, uh, 
uh, the Pacific Northwest, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's just an interesting um, thing to think about because that is, in fact, in New York, who is using radio. It's not just immigrants, but it's people connected to diasporas, to immigrant communities. They may have lived in New York for a long time, but often have family or circulate. So, primarily ethnic radio. Marginalized voices, marginalized music. Uh, these main things shape who is using pirate radio in New York. I think we can abstract from this the kinds of things that are going to shape it. Obviously, the cost of uh, getting a license and the fact that in New York there are none left uh, means that anyone who wants to broadcast what they aren't hearing already is going to go to pirate radio. Um, we could say economics shapes it, but at the law is the thing that sets the costs of a lot of the things involved in radio, so it's not just a, a neutral thing. Obviously, access to technology shapes it, but that's actually quite cheap. Um, a 20-watt FM transmitter reaching a radius of about 10 to 15 miles can be purchased on the web for under 200 bucks. Uh, the downside to a wide radius is more chances to get caught. Um, obviously, they can move around. Uh, Pre-internet, uh, ethnic radio tended, especially in New York, to be broadcast from cheaper and lower power transmitters and much more geographically uh, constrained. Um, that, I'm going to skip this slide, uh, that is sometimes considered a negative, but actually I'm going to suggest that geographical limitation for the interests of particular communities is not necessarily a negative thing. Um, another thing about radio, obviously, is for listeners, and this is what the thing I study most is not broadcasters, but listeners, it's obviously cheap to listen, and for people who spend a lot of time in cars, which includes a lot of people who work by driving things around or driving people around, which is also uh, segregated in some cases by ethnic and class uh, um, uh, structures, uh, radio is still really useful because people are in places where radios are present uh, or are easily accessible. So this is uh, Flatbush, uh, which is one of the places where there's a huge amount uh, of pirate radio. And uh, uh, these are also, as you might no, places where broadband access is, is likely to be low. In poor neighborhoods um, in the US, you have much lower internet connectivity, much lower levels of uh, internet, of computer uh, ownership. Uh, it's also extremely dense. Uh, so Kensington and Flatbush are two neighborhoods that I looked at, uh, just Brooklyn for comparison on the top, just to see it's incredibly dense here. So um, unfortunately, you know, we don't use, we use imperial system, so miles, not kilometers, but uh, Kensington, 67,000, uh, 423 people, F Flatbush, 55,422 people, also a poor area, uh, or poorer area um, for New York, uh, also a non-English speaking area, uh, percentage of people that speak English not well or not at all is quite high in Kensington and reasonably high in Flatbush compared to rest of New York. Lots of foreign-born residents, uh, higher than the average for New York, so almost half in both Kensington and Flatbush of people born outside of the U.S. Uh, again, 25% below the poverty level, uh, much higher than in New York, 15% in Flatbush, much higher than in New York. I just thought this was interesting. Relatively high percentage of males, I don't know why this is gendered, in transportation occupations, going back to the idea of who might be using radio. Right? So what are people doing with radio? They're claiming space uh, by when they are listening, because the sound of radio redefines the space when you are listening to it. And if you are listening to radio in Spanish, or Russian, or Uzbek, or Hebrew, uh, or listening to Soka, or Kompa, uh, or uh, Haitian religious uh, broadcasting, of which there is a huge amount, uh, you are redefining that space in the moment as associated with your community, and you are marking yourself uh, in ways that are also risky uh, to outsiders who don't necessarily see those voices, those sounds, those languages as a good thing. So you're claiming space, again, uh, tied to particular kinds of jobs. Uh, people, again, also who work, for example, in kitchens. Often there's a radio in the back of the kitchen. This is also something that is structured by race and class. Um, these can all be turned into nodes of, in a sort of diasporic communication network. Uh, people also are intertwined in lots of offline ways of connecting. So another place you'll hear radio is in dollar vans, which are semi-legal, semi-official pirate uh, sort of uh, group taxis. 
Uh, and you also will see advertisements on dollar vans for the kinds of music that is also mostly heard on pirate radio. And you can't find out a lot of these, about a lot of these shows, for example, uh, by listening, uh, by uh, going online. Most of these venues are not online. So if you want to know uh, who these uh, um, legends and actions are, in this case, uh, you need to be in the neighborhood physically where these posters are and where you can get the local radio station, right? So again, you're coming in on your own terms, into, on, on their terms, into the space of the community, and you won't know about it if you're not physically there. Many of them have some kind of web presence, but uh, it's often very spotty. So this is one of the biggest Haitian stations, but actually uh, the um, Facebook page only was started in 2016. Uh, and uh, continually the online uh, broadcasting uh, is, dis is disconnected and not working. Um, there's also cultural reasons for offline radio use because many of the communities involved in radio have historically listened to radio where they come from, Haiti being one of the main examples. They're incredibly dominant in pirate radio. And Haiti is a country that has, uh, oh, I don't have the numbers right here. It, is a very, it has a very low literacy rate. And so radio is incredibly important in Haiti for sharing information and culture and also religion. And so people bring that experience and that expectation of being connected to your history and your community with the act of radio listening. And so there's a way in which asking people or suggesting that they abandon that practice is actually also asking them to move away from a connection to a history that they are a part of. And so that's something that I think adds to how pirate radio or really offline broadcasting still has advantages, even though they're sometimes called uh, limits. Uh, so uh, all of these things structure, and especially in the last two minutes, I want to talk about this concept of collective intimacy, which I think is something that is really, uh, can be helpful for thinking about if you want to design technology and or policy or spaces for marginalized communities, you need to be able to facilitate the experience of collective intimacy. So I'm actually going to jump ahead to that. Um, right, radio has enabled claiming this physical space, uh, but generating this intimacy of shared listening. And this is because partly sound is a form of touch. It's shared it's felt in the body. And when you are co-present with others, you respond in time with others to sound. And that can be an intimate experience uh, when you listen together in time with others. And so my one graph, uh, I spent hours on this. Uh, <laughs> the idea is listening at the same time, especially if you're in the same space, but even if you're not, uh, if it's ephemeral and synchronous, meaning at the same time, there's a, there's a kind of connection you are aware of with other people. You're breathing, you're responding together to sound, to voices, to religious experience. And this is very different than how radio scholars historically have talked about radio intimacy, which is like a very individualistic and personal thing, or sometimes tied to sort of domestic spaces like the home. But this kind of intimacy is actually about being intimate with a group in a collective experience. And that has to do with being vulnerable as a group in a collective experience. And so in a white supremacist context, uh, in an ethno-nationalist context, right, being publicly uh, responding to your cultural sounds or voices, again, marks you and makes you vulnerable to the kinds of hostilities against immigrants, against people of color, against different cultural groups that are looked down on uh, by virtue of, by your own response to your own sounds in a sort of semi-public space. But that vulnerability, that risk, is also where you can be affirmed if, it is, if something doesn't go wrong, right? The chance to feel at home for a moment in a space. And for people who are displaced, uh, who are uh, um, con not connected or seen or reflected in dominant media networks, that moment is also really important. Uh, I'm going to skip the, academic, the other academic quote and just say, um, the last thing about uh, this is I think this helps explain the kinds of nonlinear innovative practices that people uh, engage in when pursuing their media needs. And so one thing that happens is now is something called call to listen, where people use their non-smartphone mobile phones to call a phone number and use their minutes to listen to the radio. And this is not a using the latest technology and the fastest speeds and yada, yada, yada. But it came out of mostly Haitians after uh, the earthquake who needed to hear what was happening in Haiti. And this one company who now owns a patent on it called Audio Now developed the system of using mobile minutes to call a radio station. And so this is not something that I think someone who comes, you know, when I was in the Bay Area 
you know, surrounded by sort of Silicon Valley types, they were not thinking about this as innovative because it's not going forward into some new technology that you can bring and sell to people. But it was innovative because people hadn't thought about using radio in this way, in this broad way. And it still continues and it's a way to actually find out. You can go to the Audio Now site and it's a map of sort of immigrant interests in, uh, in, in America because those are the people who are using it. Another example of this that another scholar has written about um, is uh, Cambodian communities use conference calling and they will have a thousand people call a, a conference call together and treat it like radio. And I mean, it's just, I, I'd never heard of this. So I say, I went, it disappeared down a rabbit hole because I just started finding out about these bananas, like amazing ways people are experimenting with pursuing shared, collective, intimate experience in, in real time. So uh, I think I'll stop there. I have basically, yeah, here's the um, call to listen. Here's the, that this is one of the um, conference calls. So when we think about affordances, I would say we have to think about the listening side. Uh, the experience of listening, because that's what listeners are interested in. Like, and I know and a lot of people are excited about the broadcasting, but again, if there's communities, there's listeners. And so how we might think about the implications of things like collective intimacy for our understanding of privacy and security, I think is really important. Think about what demands they make on communication technology, how we could design for them, and also this might suggest different changes in law. So I will stop there. Sorry for going really fast, I know. Uh, there was a lot to get in. I'm happy to talk more later and I can share the slides if that's helpful. So thank you. Thank you, Larissa. Um, are there any questions? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll just do it. Oh, can I say uh, anything to my... Sure. I didn't tell you easier. I didn't tell you before, so it's totally no shade, but my name's Larissa. Uh, <laughs> no, that's why I wanted the mics. And I, no, no, you don't, I didn't tell you before, okay. so it's fine. I'm just going to say it to the group. <laughs> Thank you for telling me. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, I had a question about this term pirate radio and why you choose to use that term. Um, I've done a lot of work in radio with communities, and they generally tend to not want to use that term? Yeah, that's a great question. Anybody just want to do some more? That's a great question. Um, it depends on the community. So uh, it depends on the community. Uh, so some communities are very excited about the term and some are not so much. Part of it for me is that uh, um, Community radio, in this, at least in the States, is often tied to a particular kind of license. And what's interesting is the communities that are on illegal broadcasting, uh, uh, they, uh, uh, who are not trying to get a license, don't, are, are very different than the communities that are either trying to pursue low power FM or community radio. Uh, but I also come from especially the, the, the UK history of it, in which everybody uses the term pirate radio like proudly and excitedly, so it may also be a carryover from that. Some of the people in New York say it in some contexts and also not in others. Uh, I don't mind signaling because I think illegality is sometimes a really good thing and an important thing given a legal system that is not designed for colonized people. So I don't mind uh, uh, using that, that term in the sense that um, uh, pirate spaces were spaces where, uh, pirate ships were spaces where people were fleeing other kinds of hierarchies often. Um, but you're right, it's definitely a fraught, a fraught term and not everybody likes it. It's totally true. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, there's an era of pirate radio in the UK, I'm thinking of like the Rinse FM era, where the, the act of distributing music via pirate radio was very intertwined with the creation of music and shaped the aesthetic of the music in a lot of ways. Um, have you observed anything like that in New York or any of the other places where you're looking at pirate radio right now? Uh, yeah, so coming from the UK where pirate radio is overwhelmingly about music, it was interesting already to come to New York and find that it's, a lot of it is about Christianity and then also other, but they're like, again, Haitian religious stations are like a huge branch and there's also uh, some, uh, some Jewish stations, uh, especially around Flatbush and Midwood, uh, um, but there is a lot of music still and the places that I've seen it most was in connection to these um, posters for uh, events that are not advertised online. So there is um, a, a geographical sort of community-based network of information around uh, and, and also running along these these uh, van lines that are sort of commuter routes. So, excuse me, so they are um, 
uh, those are, are spaces where, where people are circulating information and music that are not in other networks, um, but are very much uh, economies, like whole, whole, like bands will come in and tour and only play in those kind of places. And you would only find out about it if you were listening to the radio or if you saw one of those posters. Uh, I don't know about sales of recordings. Uh, I did have a slide up of stacks of CDs because that's also true that uh, uh, unlicensed CD replication for a lot of the communities uh, that are, uh, um, one of my interests in pirate radio came from interest in how people uh, subvert or dodge copyright also enforcement and so uh, uh, because it doesn't fit with a lot of creative practices and so uh, a lot of the music if you want to get access to a recording of it you can't find that in a commercial space and instead you have to go again to the physical location where the community is and you have to talk to the guy with a table usually a guy with a table uh, with stacks of home burned CDs and so Again, it's this kind of semi-offline network of uh, circulation uh, of of culture that seems to I, you know I, I don't it was hard to track the money I don't know how the money where the money goes from the guy or who's who's doing the copying uh, in in that case um, and it's probably different in different um, communities as well but you know the same way you have like under bridges you have the folks selling all the CDs like that's definitely part of a lot of these networks as well so I hope that answers. Thanks for your talk. It's uh, really, really interesting. Um, I guess the question that I have is a little bit, uh, without sounding like I'm making assumptions about these topics, um, what is, you, you mentioned some of the economics around um, why pirate radio would happen over the FM band versus, say, an online radio station, but is there a legislative component to this too? For example, the idea of autom like automated um, copyright infringement services and things like that, like how does that, how does that translate in terms of risk? Yeah, uh, great question. So, um, uh, you do, uh, if you are doing web radio and you play music, you have to pay fees and there is a lower fee if you are non-commercial, but still, uh, there are fees, and a lot of people can't afford them. So, and also those fees don't usually translate into money going back to any of the communities that are making this kind of music, because they're not party to those circulations of like ASCAP and Sound Exchange are not getting money to like the Dominican Republic or uh, so forth. So, uh, so yeah, um, that's another reason for the music folks. Uh, certainly, like the another big group of folks using pirate radio are other West Indians from English speaking and countries that are doing like soca and dance hall and things like that. And uh, I, they, a lot of them, uh, interestingly, the the Jamaican and Trinidadian DJs are more likely to call themselves pirates. I just I should look into that. That's interesting. Uh, uh, compared to other groups, um, ha the Haitian groups tend to often argue that they are covered by a, s a subsection of FCC regulation, which actually doesn't apply to them, but they say that it does. Uh, um, but also, it's not clear what people say publicly about this versus what they think about it in other places because they're vulnerable. But um, to go back to your point, I think, yeah, copyright regulation is one of the many things that when you are networked in the main uh, connected to the main system and more transparent, that's one of the ways that you're going to be tracked and regulated and enforced, right? Alongside other, you know, racialized or other ways that you are regulated, tracked and enforced. So yeah, that's another cost for sure. All right, last question. <laughs> oh, okay, last two questions. Oh, okay. oh I see, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Um, have the pirate radio has been used for spreading like uh, political agenda uh, propagandas, or uh, on the contrary, has it been used for spreading like right information um, in like a war and conflict zone? Uh, that's a great question as well. Um, I mean, I think in the U.S. In there, there are also, and this is another thing. Um, there are pe there are free radio movements that are often more self-consciously political that have happened in different places at different times that call themselves free radio, they often tend not to, to focus on music and culture. And I think the sense I get is that from the folks I've talked to uh, who have been involved with it, they often see that as not political. So part of my point is also about the politics of these things that are not considered political. Um, so uh, 
I haven't, I mean, and there are, there's definitely political discussions that happen on many of these radio stations in relation to what's happening in Haiti or Trinidad or, you know, U.S. immigration policy. Uh, I mean, which has always been horrific, but is especially horrific. Lots of information about that is circulating on these networks, too. So, in that way, in terms of propaganda, um, I haven't seen that as much. I'm also limited in my language. I mean, there's Uzbek and Tajik stations, and I have to admit that I have no idea what they're saying. But um, some, it's a lot of music also, but I don't know about that. I think there are definitely times where that has happened, and certainly, I mean, I don't even know what the legal uh, regulation is. In places where there's war and conflict, there's a lot of lifting of regulations so that, because people need to send, set up communication and people are doing it licitly and illicitly. So I'm sure it happens. It would make sense. That's not what I've been observing because I've mostly in, been in the middle of big cities where currently we don't have overt war and conflict um, currently. So <laughs> we'll see what happens with that. Okay, super quick. <laughs> Yeah, so, so actually, because uh, your question actually made me think of something really important. Um, to what extent do communities that are, that are um, um, say, fleeing a, a, a war or other disaster, um, w what do they consider their prized possessions in terms of what they will take with them? Is a radio something they will grab as they're running out of their house? Um, you know, or a phone, for instance. What, what will they have with them that will ena enable them to connect later on? Um, I don't study that, <laughs> so I can't say. Uh, I mean, I think phones are common. I think radios you can often buy, so people may not, but with phones, often because they're tied to contracts, this is speculation, uh, people carry phones. I do know people in, there's a group in uh, Brussels, there's a DJ collective called um, uh, Rebel Up Sound Clash, and they did an event a couple years back working with uh, the community of people who are waiting to hear if their refugee status has been approved, you know, because they have to just wait and it's very boring. Uh, and they can't work, they can't do anything. So these big buildings with lots of thousands of people living in them. So uh, the Rebel of Sound Clash people did a DJ party for them in which they DJed the music that people had with them on their phones. They had the, so people do bring music around with them when they leave. And they, they got, they set up an interface so that they could get the music people had on their phones off the phones to the DJ, and then he played the music uh, that people had with them. So people carry culture with them, and again, that's part of what I'm interested in is how that, you know, the politics of that, why that happens, right? They don't just, they do also carry maps and lots of strategic stuff, but they carry music, right? And so uh, I think it's important to identify when people need that as well as the other things that we talk about. So it's a, it's a great question. I'd love to study that. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you, Larissa. <laughs> thank you.